Thank you, Mariah and Dagny, for agreeing to present uh, this evening so that uh, everyone can have a, a great presentation to watch. Um, well, I want to introduce myself first, uh, because that's the order of things, not because of who's most important or anything. Um, <laughs> no offense. Uh, my name is Shane Straka. I'm the Guided Learning Manager uh, at the Science Center. So uh, I get to book a CAFE side program and uh, run our camp program and do some other things around the building as well. Uh, so uh, yeah, and uh, I want to introduce our presenters this evening for us. Uh, our presenters this evening are Mariah Connor and Dagny Paskich, and they are outreach co-coordinators for the Cardinal Space Mining Club at Iowa State. Um, a little bit about them, uh, Mariah is a sophomore at, in industrial engineering at Iowa State, um, and Dagny recently graduated from Iowa State with a bachelor's in industrial engineering, and she's working on her master's in educational technology. She also is one of our camp educators, so I just want to get that plug in there for Science Center camps. Um, both of our presenters uh, have served as the outreach coordinator for the Cardinal Space Mining Club, and that's going to be the bulk of our presentation here this evening. Um, it's in the NASA Robotics Club at Iowa State, and they've won second place for outreach in NASA's robotic mining competition and won the Engineers Week K-12 through Outreach Award in 2018 and 2019 as well. So they run the club, the outreach portion of it, and uh, they, do, they, re they really do some cool things. I'm excited for this presentation. Um, we're also going to talk about uh, some uh, work they've done on an exhibit at the Science Center as well. So uh, I think I'm going to stop bumbling over my words here, and I'm going to let our presenters kind of take it away. And uh, I'm going to keep our slides going. If you need me, uh, Mariah or Dagny, to move anything forward, just uh, give me a shout, and I will do that. Let me go back to my screen share here. All right, we should see our presentation. And I'm going to move it forward for us. All right, Dagny and Mariah, the floor is yours. Okay, good evening, everyone. Um, my name is Dagny Paskech. Um, thanks, Jane, for the introduction. Um, but yeah, so um, Mariah um, and I are really excited to share with you about our club tonight. Um, yeah, I guess, I don't know, Mariah, do you want to um, say your name again, just briefly? Sure, yeah. Um, my name is Mariah, and like Shane said, I'm a sophomore in industrial engineering at Iowa State, and I'm the current outreach coordinator for Cardinal Space Mining Club. Um, so with that, let's go ahead and get started. Sorry, there we go. You're good. <laughs> okay, uh, so to start us off, I just want to mention some interesting things about NASA. I'll have to assume that most people here are pretty invested in science um, and you know what NASA is. Um, but now in their 62nd year of being alive, their mission has developed to be the following. They are committed to drive advances in science, technology, aeronautics, and space exploration to enhance knowledge, education, innovation, economic vitality, and stewardship of Earth. That's a lot of words. Um, since 1964, there have been 22 of their missions that were focused specifically on Mars. Um, so they were, there are a whole variety of missions throughout their past. They were able to observe Mars from orbit. They were able to return images and chemical analyses back to Earth. Um, there were a couple robotic geologists, as they call them, that they sent to Mars. Um, and they've been searching for past habitability, analyzing the atmosphere. Long story short, we know a lot about Mars. Um, and on February 18th, the Perseverance rover is landing in Jezero Crater on Mars. So here you can go to the next slide. So the Mars 2020 Perseverance rover is focused on the exploration of potential life on Mars. So now that we have all this information about Mars and what its past might have been like, we want to explore um, our potential future on Mars. And so it's looking for signs of habitable conditions, signs of microbial life from the past. Um, and it's going to use a drill to collect samples of rock and soil, and those will be retrieved on a later mission. 
and it is also going to address the challenges of future human expeditions to Mars. And so it's just going to give us a lot of data on how we can get to Mars, if we can get to Mars, and how we might be able to exist there as a, just in the future. Go ahead. And the Science Center is going to be celebrating the landing of the Perseverance rover. And there aren't any events that are scheduled as of right now, but I know that they are super excited to celebrate the landing on Mars. So just keep a lookout for those upcoming events because they will be happening. Yes, we are still confirming details on those. So just keep a lookout for uh, on our social media and communications and we'll make everyone aware. Uh, we have some fun stuff planned. Okay, so in addition to doing um, space missions, um, NASA um, also has a pretty significant STEM engagement program. And so um, there have 10 um, center offices for STEM engagement and they're all around the United States. Um, they also have a pretty good website full of resources um, for educational institutions, um, families, um, schools, after school programs and stuff like that. Um, and so, but yeah, one of these, um, Center offices is at the Kennedy Space Center in Cape Canaveral, Florida. Um, and this is the one that runs the NASA robotic space mining competition. So like when we get to go compete, um, we travel to the Kennedy Space Center, get to spend a week in Florida and um, at NASA. So it's pretty, pretty cool. Um, if you want to go to the next slide, I just um, put in a screenshot of the NASA STEM engagement website. Um, just so you can kind of see um, what it looks like and some of the stuff that they have on there. So. Um, but yeah, so you can go to the next slide. So just to talk a little bit about the NASA Robotic Mining Competition, which is um, what we compete in um, as Cardinal Space Mining Club. Um, basically, this is a challenge for um, engineering students um, at universities to design, build, and operate um, a lunar excavator prototype, basically a rover that mines regolith. And regolith is a word for, basically it is the, it's a kind of soil that does not have organic components. So like the soil we have here on earth um, has like decomposed like organic material, like things that used to be alive. Uh, well, I, like uh, at the moon and Mars, there are no components components that necessarily used to be alive or I guess as far as we know or whatever but um, so that's called regolith and so it behaves uh, really differently than soil we have here on earth. I would say uh, we have a regolith testing chamber for a team that we test our robot in um, and so we've kind of gotten to see the how it behaves the material and I would say it's probably the closest to actually like flour like you'd use for baking. A lot of people think that it is similar to sand um, like you'd find on the beach but actually it's like closer to flour. So if you try to like put some flour in a jar and pour it around, like you'll see it's kind of behaves really weird. So it's interesting to drive on, interesting challenge um, that we um, do. But yeah, um, you can go to the next slide. So just to explain a little bit more about Cardinal Space Mining Club, we are a college robotics team at Iowa State University and we're competing in NASA's robotic mining competition. And so while we're participating in this, we work as a team throughout the year to engage and inspire our new members to build a competitive robot and to reach out to our community to cultivate excitement for STEM. And so pretty much what this looks like during the school year is that we have work days all day on Saturday to start designing, building, testing this robot to compete in the robotic mining competition and outside of those times, we get together as a team and we participate in community outreach events and just a whole lot of cool stuff that we'll tell you about farther on. So if you wanna to go to the next slide, there are just, here are just a few kind of cool pictures from our club. Um, you can kind of see that that is our, there are a few pictures of our robot and the general structure of the robot is that, um, it, it's, an, it's an excavator robot, kind of like Danny was talking about. And so the goal of the competition is to build a robot that can effectively mine um, chunks of regolith from the ground. And so if you want to play the video, it's a good example of our robot in action, if you can see that. Yeah, so as you can see, there's kind of like a 
I don't remember the word for it, but it's just kind of a consistent digging on the robot. And so that's usually the design that we go with and it's worked pretty well. Um, so it's a pretty exciting competition to be a part of and it's really fun to build that whole thing. So yeah, you can go ahead to the next slide. So a little bit about um, kind of our history as a team. So we're um, what, we're kind of unique as a team in that we've been um, competing in the NASA RMC since the competition's founding in 2009. So we've actually competed every every year um, since then, and um, we've done um, pretty well. We've um, those are it's kind of like a summary of some awards that we've won. Um, so the overall award. Um, for the competition is called the Joe Cosmo Award for Excellence. And we actually received that in 2013. Um, and our overall placement, um, we're pretty much in the top 10 um, and then out of 50 teams. And then, um, but yeah, so it's, it's been really fun to go down. Um, I got to travel with the team in 2018 and 2019 um, and get to meet some of the other um, colleges and stuff. So but yeah, pretty, pretty cool. You can go to the next slide. I also wanted to put a just a table on here to, to summarize kind of our involvement with outreach as well. So um, basically, um, yeah, I think over the years we've been able to kind of build on previous success and then um, take what we've learned and um, iterate on that. And so, um, yeah, it, we've got a pretty good outreach program um, that we've got going and we're excited to share it with you today. So you can go to the next slide. Yeah, so like Danny said, I'm just I'm really excited to talk about our outreach because it's really fun. Um, and kind of like NASA, we have the technical side of our organization and our mission to build and engineer and innovate. But in addition to that and to supplement that, we have um, investment to use our resources and our background to reach out to kindergarten through 12th grade students and to really encourage them in STEM. And so um, in the next section of the presentation, we'll go through our past, present, and future outreach efforts. Okay, so when I joined uh, Space Mining as um, going into my sophomore year at college, um, one of the first things we started working on was a project um, with Akatia Elementary School, their Title I school in Phoenix, Arizona. Um, and our advisor, Mr. Heisey, his niece, Jenna, taught uh, first grade at this school. And so Jenna is the one on the screen um, towards the right with the red name tag. Um, and so basically she wanted to, she knew Mr. Heisey, like, you know, advised this robotics team and she really wanted to teach her kids about coding and robotics. And so, um, so it was a good partnership um, from the get go. And then we tried to figure out, uh, we worked with their teaching team and um, we tried to figure out what would be the best way to teach um, first graders about coding. And so, and also like robotics and space and all that kind of stuff. So what started out as a, an idea for like maybe a one hour Zoom call with this um, group turned into, uh, we planned an entire week of curriculum with them. Um, and so it kind of culminated in this um, space mission at the end. Um, we used VBOTS um, to supplement and um, support that and so, um, it was a good, BBOTs are a good tool to use with teaching first graders about programming. So we'll get into that a little bit as well. So you can go to the next uh, slide. So one of the things that I learned um, through doing the learning technologies minor at Iowa State um, through the School of Education is that when um, teaching with technology, it's a good idea to put content first um, instead of being like, oh, BBOTs are really, really cool. I want to like do bots with um, kids. So we tried to plan out our content first. And then, so you can see that's kind of an outline of our unit um, with the curriculum. So we wanted to um, introduce like what's NASA, what's, um, what do engineers do? Um, and then a little bit about our club. And then moving on to um, introducing them to coding um, and robotics and then kind of culminating in this mission at the end which if you remember back from the previous picture you can kind of see on the floor there was a map um, that looked like Mars or like a picture of Mars um, and then the BeeBots were basically the rovers and so they programmed the BeeBots to drive around on the mat um, to do different challenges. 
but yeah. So you can go to the next slide. So this is a closer up picture of a BeeBot. Uh, BeeBots are really fun. They're really good for um, pre-readers, so like first graders, second graders, um, just to learn basic programming. The way that they work are the buttons on the back uh, have different commands. And so you can push those and then hit go and then the robot will uh, basically do what you told it to do, <laughs> just like any robot. So, but yeah, you can go to the next slide. Okay, so then the following year we said, okay, this is a pretty successful um, unit that we got to do with them, but we want to be able to um, provide it to a larger audience. So what we did was the, the following year we adapted it to Iowa content standards. Um, and so we actually, we partnered with um, Central Rivers AEA and Grant Wood AEA. And if you um, haven't heard of an AEA, it stands for Area Educational Association. And the, there are six of them for the state of Iowa and they support teachers and schools um, by maybe providing resources that they could check out, um, professional development sessions, stuff like that. And so we partnered with these two AEAs to um, provide some professional development for teachers about um, the curriculum that we developed and um, help them kind of implement um, it in their classrooms. Um, and then we also developed um, kits that the teachers could check out along with the BeeBots. They had already been able to check out BeeBots, but um, we helped set, up, set it up to also check out like the mats and the challenge cards and stuff like that. This past year, we worked with Iowa State Extension and Outreach um, to then publish the curriculum under a Creative Commons license. And so it's now available for a free download on their website. Okay, you can go to the next slide. So kind of continuing off of this idea, we adapted it to use for outreach events that Cardinal Space Mining Club does. And so we can talk a little bit more about this later, but one of the opportunities that we have is to set up tables and booths at local elementary school nights and other events where kids can kind of come up to your table, play around for a little bit, and then go on to the next thing. And so what we did with this is we made mats that looks like the surface of the moon. And there are cards that we made, which are you can see on the slide. And on one side of the card, it looks like the just the lunar, um, it looks like the surface of the moon. And then you turn it over and then it has something interesting about the moon on the other side. Like there are a couple, there was a rover that we highlighted or there's a card about regolith or um, earth rise or water ice or just all these cool interesting things that are associated with the moon. And so what the kids would do is um, you would have these cards laid down on different squares on the mat and then you would tell them to program the bbots to go on a mission to go get to these tiles. And once they reached the tile they could pick it up and they could flip it over and then they could ask questions about what was on the back. And so it was a good opportunity for them to get to see how these worked kind of create their own mission with a goal and then learn something really cool about the moon as well. You can go ahead. So kind of like I mentioned, we attend a lot of community science nights that are hosted by local elementary schools. And so that includes Sawyer Edwards Fellows um, and we get to set up a booth and bring a fun activity and then we get to talk to a bunch of kids about how cool STEM is, which is my favorite part. And so Mission Artemis is an example of the type of activity that we bring. And so when we come to these science nights, we try to really pick activities that are quick, but that are really fun and engaging and exciting and allow for lots of questions and conversations about cool STEM topics that they might not already know. And so, Another event that CSM participates in is the Ames FLL scrimmage. And for those who aren't familiar with FLL, it stands for First Lego League, and it's a um, first is the overall organization, and they have programs for kids from kindergarten up until 12th grade. And First Lego League is the program that's aimed towards later elementary age and middle school, mostly middle school kids. And so, Basically what you do is you 
um, you're given a challenge and there are missions on this board that you have to com complete. You can kind of see it in the picture. Um, but they design and build a robot using Lego parts since they get to partner with Lego to complete these missions. And so they go to competitions at the end of their season as well. And so we help to volunteer for a scrimmage before the competition so that they can have the opportunity to practice for competition and we get to serve as judges, referees, and kind of whatever else is needed at that event. And then one of the other events that we get to participate in, um, so far the events we've talked about are how we're involved in our community and how we're involved with kids at schools. And we also have the opportunity to engage in outreach with Iowa State. And one of those programs is called Go Further. And Women in Science and Engineering, that program WISE at Iowa State, holds an event called Go Further every year that encourages middle school and high school girls in STEM. And so it's just a whole day of these 45 or 60 minute sessions that the girls can sign up to go to. And so CSM gets to host one of these sessions and we share stories of our STEM background. And again, we try to just bring a really fun, intensive, hands-on activity that would allow us to share our experiences and to just get them excited about the possibilities of STEM. Looks like we might have lost Dagny. Uh-oh. She's not on anymore? Don't see her anymore. Hmm. Hopefully she can get back in here. Oh, is she still? She's still in my participants list. Yeah, just saw her. Get everything going here. Okay. She's back. Let me unmute her here. Okay. Okay, <laughs> I, I got a message that said my connection is unstable and then Zoom closed. So <laughs> hopefully Welcome it doesn't back, happen Peggy. again. But okay, yeah. <laughs> Did you already talk about this slide, Mariah? No, I didn't. Go ahead. Okay. Okay. So um, one of the so one of the big projects we are currently working on is working on an exhibit with the Science Center. Um, that basically the goal of it is to um, get kids excited about um, rovers and introduced to programming. So actually, um, when I joined the team, um, that was kind of when um, we started even talking about the idea for this. Um, basically, our advisor, Mr. Heise, initially he wanted a program or a project um, for kids to be able to program a mini robot. So the original initial idea was that we had a display case outside of the machining lab at Iowa State that we used for to make parts for our robot. And the idea was that we would have a miniature robot in this display case alongside a webcam. And then at the Science Center, well, somewhere else, anywhere else, um, actually, kids could connect with an internet connection and it would bring up a display where they could type in their program and watch the rover on the webcam so they could basically be programming the robot from anywhere. So that was kind of the initial idea. Um, my brother Nathan and I kind of took the idea and um, pitched it to the Science Center as an idea for an exhibit. Um, so that basically with the rover at Iowa State, the console would be at the Science Center of Iowa to make the Science Center kind of like quote unquote mission control and then Iowa State as like Mars. Um, so that's kind of where it all started. Um, that was in 2018, but yeah, it has since um, gotten a lot. Yeah, so, okay, perfect. So. One of the original ideas um, too of how we kind of thought we could make this idea work was that um, the idea for the tiles, um, Nathan and I had this toy on our fridge when we were little and basically we could spell, like you could spell words and then it would like read the word to you based on, it would, could tell um, which letters were, which letter tiles were in the, it's called the word whammer, based on these ridges at the bottom of the tile. And so, uh, we thought, well, what we could do is we could make, instead of letters, have commands for a rover. And then 
what it could do is then um, if we hit like a transmit button, it would send that program, that list of commands to the rover and the rover would receive it and then it could carry them out. You can go to the next slide. So we built a prototype. Uh, we tested it out at the Science Center um, of Iowa's Girls in Science Festival in February 2019. And so you can kind of see here the setup for it. So um, there's three main components to the exhibit that um, were kind of developed in parallel. So we have the console and then the tiles and the rover. And we're gonna talk about each of these three um, aspects briefly, and then we'll kind of come back to the exhibit as a whole and walk through sort of our iterations. So you can go to the next slide. Okay, so while we were building the rover, obviously it started from a concept and grew into a real thing. And in that process, it went through a lot of design iterations. And so the image that you can see on the left was our proof of concept. And so basically the idea for that was what is the smallest thing that we can make that has a battery, wheels, and a way to receive and run the programs. And that was it. And so, um, yeah, we got to test that prototype at the Girls in Science Festival. And as usual, everything broke um, and some things worked and some things didn't. And so after that, we got to test the rover and the console again at the Des Moines Mini Maker Fair and five other events throughout the whole process of this rover. And so kind of the way it is now, um, the rover is all of the parts are, or most of the parts are 3D printed and it charges with induction charging. And so there is material on the wheels that allows it to charge and it takes remote instructions from tiles that are placed in the console. And so the wheels also, there are differentials on the wheels to allow it to go over obstacles. And we can talk about that a little bit more next, but I just think it's really cool to see it go from proof of concept on the left to this mini rover on the right. And like there was, there was so much iteration and problem solving and changing in between there. And it's just, Really cool to see it. Um, so if you want to go to the next slide, one of the really cool things about all of the Mars rovers is that they their wheels have what's called a rocker bogey system. And so this is a way for the rover to always stay upright and level because if you have wheels that only have one pivot point, the rover is kind of going up and down with the terrain and it's going to fall over. And so what the rocker bogies have is um, there's the rocker that's attached to the body of the robot. And then that goes down and is attached to the bogey. And so there are two pivot points in one wheel. And so you can see in the picture, even when it's going over a really bumpy terrain, there's, um, there's differential inside, or the, sorry, the rocker and the bogey allows it to go over those obstacles smoothly instead of going up and down with them. And then also inside there is a differential. And so when one side goes up, the other side goes down. So if you wanna play it, you can go ahead and play the video. And that's a good example of how that system works. Yeah, it's pretty cool. Um, yeah, and you can go ahead to the next one. Okay, so um, in addition to the rover, um, we also were working on the console. So this is um, the first and second iterations of our console on screen. And so our first console, um, you can see there were three slots for the tiles to go in. The slot was a square all the way around. Um, and so the tiles could be placed um, up or upside down um, or left or right. So one of the things we quickly realized was that um, participants would commonly come up and put the tile in. Um, and the since they're 3D printed, um, essentially how they would work is that just like those um, tiles from before, I put the picture in again, um, the ridges are only on one side. 
And so a lot of participants were putting it in incorrectly. So we tried to write the word top at the top, but then we came up with this idea, um, kind of pulling from my industrial in industrial engineering background, one of the concepts um, we learned about in class was called mistake proofing. And so it's the idea that can you engineer something so that it's impossible to make a mistake. So basically what we did was we redesigned the shape of the tile so that it had a So then participants um, make different notes that have those different combinations. Um, and then um, just so you know, I also have the internet connection thing just popped up again. So heads up. <laughs> but originally too, um, we added on another thing from design one to design two is we added some dials. So not only can participants now put in the command like go forward or go backwards or rotate um, or turn the light on, but now they can also determine the magnitude um, or how much um, forward or how, how bright or um, how much far to rotate. So that was something we added in. Um, yeah, you can go to the next slide. So the console also went through a lot of design iterations and one of the things that you can see from um, design two to three is that there were labels that were added um, to the console and the original button design was more of a dial button and those were a little bit more confusing and they were kind of easy to break and so they got switched to arcade buttons which are meant to be smashed um, and so in this iteration the tiles also got increased um, in number to so that the instructions that they were giving um, just were less confusing um, yeah you can go ahead to the next one and so design four, it just keeps getting more and more um, as we learned more about how the participants interacted with the display. There were a lot of more um, educated iterations that we were able to make. And one of the changes that we made um, to the tiles actually was, um, or to the console was it, instead of magnets, it became an RFID reader, which if you don't know what that is, it's radio frequency identification. Um, and basically it uses electromagnetic fields to identify and track the tags that are attached to objects. And so when the tile is put in, it'll read that tag and it'll know what instruction just got put into the console. And so there were also labels that were put onto the console that were integrated with them. So when you look at it, it's really, really clear what this is what's going on, what these buttons are doing, where the tiles go, what the tiles are for, just kind of all the information is simple and right there. And we also were able to make it out of more durable materials, because um, if you want to make something mistake proof, you have to make it be able to be really whacked by a kid or dropped or something like that. And so it just got made a lot more durable. And our third, um part that we um, iterated upon was the tiles. And so this is pretty cool. This was, I actually did my um, honors capstone project on the tile design and kind of like all of the, it was a really cool way to combine my interest in engineering, like industrial engineering and um, learning technologies and also get to learn about exhibit de design um, from the science center too. So that was pretty neat. Um, so just um, back to our first initial design of the tiles. So we had the same, um, corners all the way around um, and they were 3D printed and you can see the initial designs on there. Um, one of the things that I was really interested in um, was trying to figure out which symbols to put on the tiles that would be most clear as to what the tiles were meant to do. So for example, a lot of participants coming up to the table, they thought that this um, rotate button actually just physically moved the rover up and to the right. Um, but actually it just rotates it like pivots in place. So that was one of the things that um, I tried some different um, designs on the 
um, tiles that you can see. Just like with paper, I taped it right to the tile just to try some different things out. We landed on the one that was pretty much the most consistently interpreted was having four arrows that go all the way around. Um, and pretty much everyone was like, oh yeah, that means rotate. So it was really neat to be able to um, test this out because we started out, we were right next to the prototype. We got to talk to the participants directly. Um, but as we tested, we got farther and farther away to the point where our final test, we were kind of just sitting off on a bench kind of our, um, off to the side. And then we just kind of observed from a distance um, what people would do. So another thing that we um, iterated upon with the tiles um, was the, so like Mariah mentioned with the RFID, um, you can see the design three, how you can see that bottom layer has those different, pressing the different limit switches. With the RFID that allowed us to um, eliminate the limit switches, which were breaking all the time. Um, and so we just had all the tiles be flat. Another thing we did is we separated the forward arrow. Originally we had it to be where if you put it in right side up, it would make the rover go forward. And if you put that arrow in upside down, it would make the rover go backward. Well, that was really confusing. No one really understood that. So we actually just separated that into two separate commands, one that would make it go forward and a different one that would make it go backwards. Um, you can go to the next one, yeah. I also wanted to um, show um, some pictures from manufacturing the tiles because I thought it was a really interesting process. Um, so we laser cut the acrylic. Um, there were three layers, but you can see there's a picture of us using the laser cutter um, to cut up the shapes. And then once we had those three layers, um, we put in the middle layer, we cut out from a vinyl sticker using a Cricut. Um, we cut out the custom die cut um, for the labels, and so we put those on. And then we screwed the three layers together um, to hold them in place. But yeah, you can go to the next slide. Okay, so now putting it back all together, kind of big picture. So here's um, our first iteration. Um, you can kind of see the um, how it worked all together. If you want to play the video, that's um, some participants using it. You can see they put in the tiles and then we have the small rover driving around on the table next to it. Okay, um, you can go to the next slide. Yeah, so now on iteration two, we've made it to December of 2019 and a little bit like we talked about with the console, it's just getting to the point where we're starting to get that research in. We're starting to see what participants do and don't understand. Um, and it's starting to look a little bit more refined. You can see that the console and the sticker and everything is not as refined as the final design. Um, but this was where we really got to start um, engaging people and seeing it come together as a real exhibit and just saw all the pieces coming together. And so you can see too that that rover is a little bit past the proof of concept, but not to the final one yet. And so this was still in our stages of research and iteration, but really starting to get close to getting there. Okay, so with our third iteration then, um, fast forwarding to July of 2020, um, so that spring semester, we were working on manufacturing this iteration um, to get it installed. Um, and so over the summer, um, we tested it out. And so you can play that video. Um, and then so that's a picture of my brother Nathan and I um, after we spent the weekend working with um, Kenna actually was is a, manuf or a mechanical engineering student at Iowa State. And she is also a huge um, contributor to this project as well. Um, she also did her honors capstone project with related to this um, project. And she focused on the console design, um, trying to make it durable um, so it wouldn't break. But yeah, you can play the video. That's a test of the rover and console working, the one that was installed over the summer. Also, that's our cat. So. <laughs> But yeah, so you can see we got like the bar, bar graphs going at this point. Um, we've got the large label and the further along rover design as well. Whenever the video stops playing, you can move on.
This is a, a picture of kind of along with the environment. So over the summer, um, if you've been to the Science Center before, um, in the Why the Sky um, Experience platform, there's the Magic Planet um, exhibit. And so um, around the perimeter of that, um, we put down um, conductive tape to interface with the conductive tape on the wheels, um, which allows it to do the inductive charging like Mariah was talking about earlier. Um, and so that's just kind of a picture of how it is all fitting together. So you can go on. Yeah, so then we got to installation part two, because in uh, fall of 2020, it was enough time to discover some problems with the rover because we had been able to problem solve all of the short term things that happened, but we hadn't yet had a long term test of the rover. And so within those wheels, the differential was breaking. And that was causing it to kind of lilt to one side and hobble around a little bit. Um, and so we figured that we really have to make that, you know, kind of design it so that it never breaks. And so we actually got to replace it with Lego parts. And so in those rovers at the Science Center inside is a Lego differential, which was actually really nice. Um, and additionally, the grant that funds this project allowed us to manufacture five new rovers, two new consoles, and 73 new tiles. And so now there can be multiple rovers, and there are backup rovers, and there are backup consoles, and there are a bunch of tiles. And so it's just, it was really nice to be able to get those done. And so there are just a couple pictures from um, making that installation part two. In December, we got to um, go down to the Science Center and have a couple kind of manufacturing assembly days. And so there are a few pictures just from that. So this one was soldering the console circuit boards. We had sort of a, all of the rovers, um, they need the same pieces with the same methods. And so we had sort of a, you get to do this job, you do this job, and you do this job. And I got to solder. Um, so that was really cool. And then the next slide, um, that is a picture of assembling the rocker bogies. And so I don't know how well you can see it from that picture, um, but the two pieces are actually separately 3D printed and then you kind of stick them together into the full wheel. And then each individual wheel has its own motor. And so for each rover, there are four wheel pieces and six motors that all had to be put together. Um, and then on the next slide is just a, a neat dramatic picture of all of the rovers in progress. We kind of lined them all up in a row and it was, yeah, it was pretty cool. So our fourth iteration of the exhibit is coming this year. Uh, we're still working on finishing up our manufacturing of those additional components. Um, and so it should be installed sometime this year, hopefully. You can go to the next slide. So um, one of the classes I took as an undergrad student was um, American Sign Language 101. And in this class, I got introduced to the deaf and hard of hearing community. Um, and I thought, wow, that's you know a community I haven't really thought of before, but um, it would be really, really neat to reach out to them and do some STEM um, outreach with them. Um, if that's something that they'd be interested in. And I was also curious on like what they already had going on. So I looked at the Iowa School for the Deaf's website, tried to, trying to see like, you know, what sort of STEM activities and things they had. And I, I couldn't really find a whole lot. So I emailed their outreach coordinator and just basically said like, hey, we're here to help. Is there anything we can, you know, partner with you to do? So yeah, I'll turn it over to Mariah for the next slide. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so. Um, like Danny said, we began meeting with Susan Rollinger in 2019, and they have an event that they already do that's called the Saying and Signing Symposium. And basically what that is, is that they get um, kids in the deaf and hard of hearing community from all over Iowa to come to this one event. And it's just a day long, um, just a day of fun activities that are specifically designed for those that are deaf and hard of hearing. And so that's just, it's a really exciting event every year. It's been growing a lot. And I think this past year they had over a hundred kids participate. And so 
um, actually in 2019, they held their Say in Science Symposium at SCI, which I didn't even know until recently. I just thought that was really cool. Um, and so one of here you can keep, yeah. One of the things that we wanted to do with them, like Danny said, was we wanted to take um, familiar STEM learning activities from my background and from Danny's background and adapt them to be inclusive and relatable for the deaf and hard of hearing community. And we were going to basically plan their saying and signing symposium for 2020, but you know, COVID sucks. And so it got canceled. Um, so everything is just a plan, but we would really like to tell you about some of the activities that we do have planned for them. Yeah, so one of the activities um, is uh, making LED gloves. So basically the idea with this is if you've ever heard of um, long exposure photography, um, basically it's a way to take a picture, but the camera is collecting light for longer than normal. And with that, you can actually trace out patterns, you know, with, with light. And so um, one of the things we thought was, well, we could take that activity and um, they could make, um, basically what we could do is we could have like gloves, use conductive thread to connect to LEDs, and then they can make LED gloves, and then they could, um, you know, draw designs um, and do the long exposure photography. So a very visual um, activity that they can do. So yeah, can go to the next one. So another activity that we wanted to do, um, so that we've done before is called paper circuits. And you use a, um, a coin battery and conductive copper tape and an LED to kind of create this circuit on paper. When you fold over, it starts open circuit and the battery is on one end of the tape. And then when you fold over the paper, it closes the circuit and then your LED lights up. And so usually how it goes is that the circuit, you have a card and the circuit is on one side of the card. And so when you fold it closed, your LED kind of pops through the card to make a design and it closes the circuit and it lights up. So like you can see on that picture, they have those LEDs in the jar and there's a circuit that will be on the inside of that card. And so we were telling Susan about that and she realized that that might be able to be adapted to use batteries that some kids put in their hearing aids. And so instead of the regular coin battery that we use, we would just use um, the batteries that they put in their hearing aids. So that would be pretty cool. And then the other activity that we can especially um, make relatable for them is art bots. And so the way that I'm used to making these is you have a cup and you tape markers onto it. And then on the top of the cup, you have a, a vibrating motor or a shaker motor. And so what it does is it will wobble the cup around and then it'll be a little bit unstable on the markers. And so it'll kind of draw all over your paper. And Susan told us that some of these kids, since they can't hear their alarm clocks in the morning, they have um, bed shaker alarms. And so it's literally just a, a, a bed shaker. It just shakes so hard that it wakes you up. And so her idea was that we could make like this heavy duty art bot where instead of the little shaker motor, we could use their bed shaker alarms um, just to make that interesting for them. And so with that, that is our outreach past, present, and future. And we thank you so much for coming to this and being part of it. And please let us know if you have questions. What can we tell you about? All right, cool. I have a question I'm gonna start us with here. Jacob, who's five years old, wants to know if it snows on Mars. Do you know the answer to that question? That's a great question, Jacob. Um, yeah, so let's see. It's really cold on well, Mars. So short answer, yeah. <laughs> short answer is it doesn't snow on Mars. Um, I was trying to think how best to answer that though. So I guess one of the reasons why it snows on Earth is because we have like the water cycle where the water will um, evaporate into the sky and then make clouds. And then eventually the clouds get so heavy and then the, um, and then we have rain. Um, but at Mars, um, they, there's really, the atmosphere is so thin um, on Mars and so, and they don't really have rain. So I don't know. Brad, do you want to add to that at all? No, I think you covered it. That's about as much as I know. <laughs> Great question. <laughs> cool. Um, another question here, um, just with uh, 
with your outreach commitment, um, just why your team spends so much time and effort working on like STEM education and STEM learning. Yeah, Mariah, do you want to start and I can add? Sure. So pretty much, so I'm a sophomore on the team, so I have about two years experience with them. And the lame reason that isn't the actual reason is that the robotics NASA's RMC competition um, that's part of their competition is that they want teams to use their resources and their time to reach out to their community because they think that that is just a really good use of time and resources and so there are awards for that but I think honestly that the reason that we're actually invested in outreach is just because there are people that continue to join the team that just really have had positive experiences in STEM when they were kids, especially in like the K through 12, well, only in the K through 12 grade. And so there are people that come onto the team like me and Dagny that had those experiences that really want to share them. And now that we're on this level of being on a college level team, we have the opportunity of having so much access to information and resources and just really cool people that do really cool things and so at least for me i just i just want to share it and i love being able to work with the community and to show them what we're learning about and what they can do with their future in stem if they choose to do that yeah that's a great answer i'll just quickly add on that um for me like informal STEM education, so stuff like outreach, um, camps, programs, workshops, that's like definitely my passion. It's like what I love doing. And so every chance I get, like I want to do more. So I have a lot of fun with it. And it's really cool to do um, huge projects like the ones that we talked about, um, because you can really see how they um, impact um, a large audience and you get to interact with lots of cool people. So but yeah. Cool. Um, I have a question here. Um, how large is the area where the rovers will roam mm -hmm. or rove? Mm. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I guess, do you, do you mean like the ones that we build or probably the ones that we're making? I don't know. The ones we're making, yeah. Okay, yeah. So, Let's see, I don't know. Ryan, jump in if you know the exact number in feet. I'm trying to think of like about how large it would be, but I think Magic Planet is like, I don't know, maybe like eight feet by eight feet, but it's an octagon. And so I think basically kind of what we're envisioning too is that we would split that area up into two separate parts and we'd have a rover and a console in one half and then separated by like some sort of barrier and then a rover and a console on the other half. So we could actually have like two going at the same time, but yeah. Yeah, it's enough that the rovers can have enough room to move around. The rovers themselves are only about this big, um, which is, that's kind of a bad reference because it's just my hands, but <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's only enough space for them to drive around. Like it doesn't take up a whole room and it's not a tiny little tank, but it's just, yeah, a, I don't know, about eight by eight would probably be right. Yeah, I think that's about right. Um, I have a question, um, just kind of what you at, what you ended on, I just so appreciated you sharing just your efforts to, to make your outreach, you know, uh, adaptive and inclusive for all folks. And I'm sure you've learned a ton just about your process and then just that end user experience, you know, and then getting to incorporate that into your process. And so I just noticed as you talked about, well, we learned that that didn't work. And so we did that. You used very positive language. You never sounded discouraged by much. In <laughs> fact, it sounded like those failures were a part of your process. I just kind of wondered if, if your group has any discussions around that or, if, you know, even if that's something to be almost celebrated in your quest to, you know, make that, that end product the best it can be. Yeah, for sure. I can just speak to like, um, when I was doing my research project, um, specifically, it was, I mean, every time, and honestly, just every time in general, every time we learned something, um, 
it was really exciting. Like, for example, like when we learned that participants would flip it in any direction and we should maybe make it so they can only fit it in one way. It was like, oh, like that makes so much sense. Like, that's awesome. So I think just for me, like, um, I love learning new things. And so stuff like that was just really exciting to be able to be um, like, okay, we can change it. We can make it even better. But I think the other thing that helps too is that these projects that we work on, whether it's like for the deaf and hard of hearing or the rover or building our robot, we get to work on it with a team of people that care about the same things that we do. And so a lot of the time, if there is a failure or a mistake, it'll be frustrating for a little bit, but it turns like funny pretty quickly. Like, oh, the rover drove and like everything blew up. Like that's a little, that's a little bit funny. Um, and so I think it was just also that aspect of having a shared experience in getting to learn something like Amy said is just a really powerful way to have it be a positive experience instead of just being frustrated that it didn't go the way you thought it would. Actually, I'll share uh, a quick anecdote. So we use um, this program called Slack um, to communicate with our team. Actually, I think we switched to Microsoft Teams, but we used to use Slack when I was on the team. Um, and we have a channel on Slack. You can have different channels for different topics. One of our channels is called Classic Blunders. And so every time we make a mistake, we post a picture in there. <laughs> and so it always gets a lot of like reactions and stuff. So, um, but yeah. Cool. Thanks for sharing uh, with that. Uh, I'm not seeing any other questions. So it looks like we're gonna kind of wrap up here in just about an hour on the dot. Um, just want to, uh, as we're kind of, this is just a perfect topic to help us kind of gear up uh, for February and the landing of the Perseverance rover. Um, and just uh, just want to make everyone aware we're we're going to be the Science Center will be open on the 18th of February, the the day we're due to land, and uh, hopefully we'll have uh, that landing up on video for folks to watch. And then we'll have a lot of programming around that as well, leading up to it and uh, throughout that weekend. So. Uh, yeah, keep a lookout for that. Come visit the Science Center and uh, eventually you'll get to see uh, a pretty cool rover exhibit and you'll know exactly how that started. And so that's pretty cool. I always appreciate that uh, kind of inside baseball look at things, even at the place where I work and get to see it all anyway. So uh, this has been great. So thanks a lot for uh, sharing, sharing all your work with us. It's pretty cool. So um, I saw I had a question in the chat. Um, I've been recording this. So uh, once that's all done, I will share it off to the correct people I work with and we'll make that recording available for folks as well. So uh, yeah, I guess I'll let everyone get to their uh, snow shoveling here and uh, have a great rest of your evening. Thanks for hanging out with us. And uh, yeah, keep looking for details about our next cafe site and I hope that you enjoyed yourself.